Hello everybody and welcome to this very first very exciting edition of Wine and Wild Wisdom with myself Laura Dalligan and the gorgeous and multi-talented April Shaley. Hello! Hi! I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited. This is our virgin one as well, so you're my very first. <laughs> oh, wonderful! Oh, that's, that's thrilling. Thank you. <laughs> that's okay. So, um, I've got the thing is, it's okay for me because I have the wine and it's about half eight at night here in England. Okay. But I'm making you drink in the day, aren't I? Yeah, but that's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good excuse, you know. It's a Monday. It's three something p.m. here in, in Salem, Massachusetts, and I'm gonna have a little wine and you know. <laughs> So this is a Salem to Glastonbury broadcast, and that's pretty cool. It is. I've always said that they're sister cities, you know? Remember when I, vis I visited there once, unfortunately I didn't meet you when I was there, but I met quite a few really great people, some of whom I still keep in touch with, um, and I thought, gosh, you know, there should be something set up, you know, there should be some official way that these two places are sister cities, because they have so much in common, you know? I bet Salem's a bit bigger than Glastonbury, though. <laughs> a little, yeah, it's bigger. It's it's closer to Boston, you know, so it's a little bit more urban, you know. Yeah. Um, but but it has some of the same feel. I, I would really love to come back there and visit sometime soon. It's such a great place. We shall oh. make it so. We shall make it so. We've just about got Google Plus working. The next step is getting you over here. <laughs> right. Like, really. You know, <laughs> when, I ran, when I got there, I like ran up the tour. I was so excited. I was like, this is what I read about, the Miss of Avalon. <laughs> you know, it was the first little witchlet, you know, learning all oh, this stuff. Lit. That's the best word ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to come to Salem as well. I've seen lots of pictures of all the witchy stuff there. It looks amazing. It can be, you know, it has its pros and its cons. You know, we, we definitely have genuine witchcraft and and a lot of a lot of different ways that, that people are very profoundly spiritual and profoundly magical. And then there's the witch Disney side where it's really for sale and and there's that element too. So, you know, when you, you live there, the ooh ah of the witch Disney wears off with within about five minutes and, and you really want to get to what's authentic. But luckily that's here too. I mean, it is really a mecca. It draws, it kind of like Glastonbury, it really draws people, you know, in, so. Yes, it does, it does. I just, I think, yeah, definitely, there's something that's got to occur with both cities. But, oh, cities, we're not a city, we're a small town. But um, anyway, I know we want to sort of, we've got a little bit of a focused time schedule. So, um, we've got a lot of things to talk about. Goddesses, sex, death, Babylon, Samhain, Equinox. Yeah. Oh, that's right, we've got the equinox coming up in Samhain, yes. So I thought it was a good time to actually, this will be coming out for the autumn equinox, so as Persephone goes into the underworld, as we get to the darker part of the year, it's quite a good time to start talking about the dark goddess a bit more, isn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. So when did you first start, I know I first noticed seeing you doing the belly dancing and was just like, Wow, amazing. And then obviously I follow your astrology, it's absolutely bang on every time. And I really love with your astrology that it's not just what's going on in the stars. You bring in the myths, you bring in the magic, you bring in the goddess and the tarot, and that just hits home really amazingly. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, that's the, the astrology, yeah, it, it's all connected to me. I can't really separate it, you know, so. So when did that? When did you start being called to the dark goddess or called to the goddess or called to magic? When was that really apparent to you? It was sort of a gradual process, I think, that sort of snuck up on me. But I, you know, as a little kid, I was, you know, doing magic, not knowing that that's what it was at all, you know, but I would set up things and do sympathetic, you know, what, meta what magic is metaphor, right? So I was doing like, metaphorical things like if I wanted to see something happen I would create something sort of symbolically to, to make it something under my control like a mini thing a mini drama that would maybe make <laughs> the other thing happen like we do right in a, in a circle <laughs> so I, I just had no idea and I, I was speaking to you know all the imaginary imaginary friends and and I just I had a whole you know whole cast of characters that I had with me you know as a kid I I had a pretty lonely, you know, childhood, so I really counted on that. So I, I 
the, the plus side of having that, you know, a kind of that kind of childhood is that I really look, I needed something. So I developed to this quality, you know, this skill or whatever focus. And then it wasn't until later that I really got a conscious sense of that this is witchcraft by, you know, doing women's studies in, in college and, and, uh, and making that those connections were being made, you know, there was a goddess religion that actually happened. And, and, you know, I remember reading when God was a woman, you know, that book from the 1970s and Rolling Stone. And that was like a big deal. Like, of course, of course, you know, I remember me reading the Miss of Avalon and that sort of animated the whole thing. Like, yes, that's how this can be, you know, even if this is not a, true story but what's truth and and you know these kinds of things exactly i kind of think that uh, the god without the goddess would be like a grumpy old man you know you know like bitter and laid. <laughs> sorry without the goddess he's not getting laid exactly it's like a grumpy non-getting laid guy who just gets really twisted and cold about things right and it's nasty to people because like i'm not getting any sex come on exactly exactly <laughs> it needs to be him no one Exactly. So, yeah, I, I think. Who wants um, to listen to him? God. <laughs> it's like in the pub. You're just like, oh no, a boy. Right. Oh no. Sure. <laughs> that again. You're gonna smite me. Like whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I think that it's really good because Glastonbury is um, very goddessy, as you know. It's very yeah. goddess. So there is a strong god energy with the Tor and Gwynap Neath and the king, the fairy king and the god of the underworld with the Tor, which I think really needs to be um, pushed a bit more because even though it's amazing it's so goddessy here, I kind of feel we have the opposite here. There's lots of beautiful, powerful women <laughs> yeah. going, where are the guys? <laughs> where are the men? Where's the masculine? Right, so in that case the goddess isn't getting laid. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and magic re requires everyone getting laid for it to work on it. <laughs> So we need this balance, you know? Absolutely. Which brings me on to the goddesses. Well, the goddesses that we're kind of um, talking about, the darker goddesses, which people kind of go, ooh, ooh, you're talking about evil, you're talking about bad things. Um, goddesses of sex, goddesses of, the, of, of magic, and they've kind of got a bad rep, haven't they? I mean, which particular goddess, do you, do you work with a particular goddess, or is it a, a variety of goddesses that you're really drawn to? You know, I've I've gone through phases of which face I I feel most um, that I can most embody. You know, at a time like there was a time in my life where Persephone was my goddess. You know, and then it's well, there's Kali too. Well, there's also Lilith. I'm very Lilithian. You know, a lot of people associate me with Lilith. And when I think of Lilith, I think of you, and that's that's cute and everything. But like. You know, a little scary too, <laughs> like whatever. Scary for everyone, <laughs> including me. And then, um, you know, and then Babylon, of course, you know, with the Thelemic, the, the, the 156 current. Um, to me, they're all, and some people get upset with this, and I don't really care. I mean, um, they're all faces of the same, or a, a root energy that I think of as the dark goddess, that, that, side of the feminine, that menstrual, um, non-procreative, pleasure-oriented, um, uh, transformative, transforma transformation-oriented, the cycl cyclical, all that stuff oriented feminine energy, you know? Um, and so, you know, and there's many similarities between like Kali and Babylon with the crossing of the abyss and the, and the losing complete loss of the ego and, and all of that stuff. You know, there's people get upset when I make those, those connections. But again, you know, people get upset about everything. They do. <laughs> you know, if one's I, that's the right what, what comes through me and what, what comes up into my consciousness, I, I've learned to trust that. And I think that's a fundamental piece to being a witch and to being a priestess and to being uh, any of these roles. You have to trust that voice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess, well, I don't guess I kind of know, but um, with the path of the dark goddess, you, you don't often get the easiest of rides, do you? It's, um, it's full on transformation, full on awakening. Um, so what would, what do you feel is the plus point to this journey you've been on? What do you think that you've kind of gained from it? For people that haven't really, for people who don't really know about the dark goddess so much about what that entails working with these energies. 
Well, I thought I'd pick up my wine and take a sip because it has been stressful to be a <laughs> good spell. You know, I mean, really, you, you know, like, I mean, um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, I, once I knew that that's what it was, that it had a name, I recognized my life, you know, because it had already been like that. It had already been, I'd been challenged at every turn as a child. You know, I really had to, I had to fight for my survival, you know, as a kid, and um, I needed to give that meaning as a, as a teenager and then as a young adult. And then, and then, but here's the thing that happened. So then I started to romanticize the dark goddess and then I'm going to be a priestess of the dark goddess. Isn't that, you know, and I thought that was so great. And now I realize, look what that really fucking means. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, that's gonna be super. Like whatever. And I would say it's a misery, you know, because you did ask me like what the positive pieces are, and there's many, many, many. But that you pay, you pay. If you want to incarnate her power, you pay. You know, as recently as I did a, I did a performance as Kali very, very recently at a place called the Star and Snake. It's an art, art church, and it's a oh, wow. uh, in New Hampshire that uh, dear friends of mine have recently um, developed. And um, so I was, I was um, work, uh, performing as Kali, and, you know, the, the thrill is the power that runs through you, you know, and you just, you could feel it doing everything to you and to the audience, and you know you're, 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 you're channeling that current, and it's amazing. But I also cut myself with the sword when I was swinging it, like really deeply. This is after I practiced and practiced and practiced for like, you know, months or weeks and every day, I don't know, a long time. And I knew this magical weapon very well and I cut myself. So there's my pride right there. You know, so she totally extracted some blood. And then my boobs fell out of my bra. <laughs> so I did this thing where I'm like jumping with the sword. I'm feeling real fierce. And then my boobs came out. So I'm bleeding from a gash, and I, my boobs are out. My, I, the blood <laughs> you so well. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to like, you know, I'm dancing. And I have to like put them back in with my back to the audience, but I'm trying to like look like I'm dancing, like I'm doing that on purpose. And, mm. So that's the kind of thing, you know. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't identify your ego with it. You can't. You can enjoy the power as it moves through you. And, and, and do your best to, to direct it. But if you identify with it as you are that power, you have made a big mistake. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of people, well, not a lot, but I, I know that that happens a fair bit with, I'm with the dark goddess, I'm doing all this, look at me, glamour, look at my power. And you're just going to go, oh gosh. And you wait for the meltdown to happen. And it invariably does, doesn't it? Yeah. it, it it's like you kind of hook into as a way of control or a way of kind of bigging themselves up. Right. Right, and I think sometimes people use it because they have had uh, experiences where their self-esteem may not be very high, and they want that something to feel powerful about, and they can claim that as, as power, you know, uh, yeah, you have, you'll pay. You will pay. Yeah. And rightly so. It's not cute. It's not cute energy, and it, it demands respect. Absolutely. Otherwise, you'll get cut and your boobs will come out. Otherwise, you'll get cut and your boobs come out, like mine. <laughs> Well, you know, or worse, or worse. Or worse. <laughs> so now I have a lovely scar, and it's from her. And you know, the the doctor was like, you know, that was there, who also was Shiva in the performance, by the way, was the doctor that treated the cut. This is great, you know, the whole thing. And he said, you know, do you want do you want this? You need you need to go get this sewn up if you don't want a scar. And I was like, that would be silly. Yeah, this is this is not. A <laughs> if I went through this, I want a scar, you know. <laughs> so, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and then um, I know I know that um, it's interesting. Cause, you know, I see the the sort of dark goddess Celtic. I've always worked more with the Morrigan, which the Irishy dark goddess side. It's, it's interesting, it's the same kind of energy, but in a very kind of a different background, different backdrop, and it, it's the, the, the sex and death and the same, you will work, you will pay, you will do this, comes through there. But so this, it kind of infiltrates all the different aspects, and all these goddesses have, have all, it's hard to get any information, on, especially the Celtic, because it's not written down that much, only by priests, so therefore you've not got 
really any good um, good good writing about the goddess. But um, I lost my track of thought. This is a, this is the danger of drinking wine when I lose my track of thought about things. Um, but yeah, you've got the same kind of energy, but it's all been given. It's very hard for people to kind of shake that off, isn't it? That it's evil. That the dark goddess, it, you know is evil and I, I think that even when you say that people are quite open-minded quite spiritual or quite pagan they still freak out a bit at, at the hearing of the dark goddess or the name the morrigan or babylon or Lilith. there's still that kind of woo feeling um about things yeah i would agree I've, I've heard that and i've also heard that i'm being negative so that's like new age woo woo speak for you being evil i think you know mm -hmm. like bringing something negative into it why would you dwell there like why would you spend time with that um, why don't you focus on what's positive? That's what magic is for. And, and my feeling is like, oh, then you've, you've missed a whole wealth of power and energy and beauty and um, experience and uh, all the things that she brings. I mean, ultimately, the, God, the dark goddess in any of her forms, what she brings is illumination. Yes. It's yeah. like what you call the anantiodromia. You know, you go through the extreme opposite of anything, and it, you come out with its opposite eventually. So if you go extreme dark, you get light. You get that sense of what the divine light is within you and who you are without all the things you're attached to. That's her ultimate gift. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And, and like you were saying as well, the opposite of... Um of kind of being ego -y about it is repressing it, isn't it? And that's equally as bad for you as being like, I am the dark goddess incarnate. The, the yes. equal thing is like, there is no dark, there is no dark, love and light, love and light, you know. Yes. Don't bring dark into the equation. Um, and it's, that's equally as unhealthy. You've got, you know, both ends of that spectrum. Right. And then, <laughs> yes. just a second. I don't know if I heard the, the last part. Oh, no, no, no. I think I was just putting it out there. I, I, it was just that they just discussing how it's equally as um, bad for you to that side as it is to kind of dwell in that kind of ego side of things. Yes. Yeah, because, it, you know, you, you also, things get flat. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. they get too dimensional and they lose meaning. You know, it's like right hand, left hand path kind of stuff. You know, if you go too far down the right hand path, things get disembodied, they get meaningless, and they get self-righteous. And you know, so that path of light, and if you go too far down the dark, you know, the left hand path, then things get pornographic, you know, and they get, uh, you get too attached, like that inverted pentagram goes too far down, you get mired in, in the worldly things, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the, the, the path of the initiate, that's why it's the middle pillar. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. both you know you've got both going on in balance exactly exactly <clears throat> so do you um i mean i don't yeah i don't think any goddess is totally dark or light but do you work with anything to, do you or do you or do you sort of as you say explore the dark goddess until you reach the, the light within we've frozen again a little bit there so if you could just ask <laughs> Time. No, no, it's no, it's causing my internet's freezing. Um, I was just saying, do you work with any other goddesses? Any goddesses that are sort of as lighter goddesses, or do you work with other aspects of the same deities to get to the lighter side of things? I work with Venus a lot. I work with Aphrodite a lot, and I think she's got both of those sides. You know, she's the goddess of love, but she's also the goddess of war. And what's the difference? You know, like <laughs> because, and of course, there's a huge difference. I think the universe is made of love, ultimately, like love in that larger sense. But you know, Venus has to do, I think, with um, creative, sexual, or uh, passionate love, personal love. Of course, you could look at her different. I mean, it, it, again, if you look at any goddess for any long uh, period of time, you can see all the goddesses within them and all the aspects. So you could, you know, they can always do that. Um, uh, so I work, I do work with Venus and she's considered to be sunlit. She's a sunlit goddess. She's always nude. She's nothing. She hides nothing, you know, and in that respect, I connect her to Babylon as well. Who's a red goddess. You know, some would not even say she's a dark goddess at all, you know? Um, so they're both always naked. Lilith is always naked. You know, there's that part of the instinctual self, but Venus is kind of cultured though, too, in a way that Lilith is not 
really. You know, Babylon has culturedness to her as well. Um, but she's, she's like, you know, riding a beast. I mean, you know, she's the holy whore. Venus is the holy whore also. Um, but there is something very about aesthetics that Venus is, is about. You know, she's about aesthetic and things being pleasing. She's sort of the cosmic courtesan. You know, she wants to get along and have things be pleasurable. Whereas the other goddesses are kind of about pleasure, but it's but it's like a little more raw. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see Venus on the back of a beast, do you? She's always kind of very demure in her poses. It seems so. Yeah. Yeah. But always naked. So it's interesting. Always. Like she shows that she's with the rest of the gods. She's like, I'm part of this pantheon, but I'm naked. You know. I forgot my clothes. I forgot. Don't forget, I still have my roots back there in those those raw, you know, feminine forms. But I'm here right now, you know, with my pretty hair and my flowers. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so she's kind of. Uh, she, she, I think you look back at Venus's history, isn't she? She is Ishtar, basically come to Greece, hasn't she? Isn't she really? I think so. Well, that's well. Obviously, we don't know, but that seems to be seems to be the way the way it works. But um, yeah. Um, so with Babylon and the Red Goddess. Can you tell people who don't know much about her? Because there isn't that much to be, you know, unless you're in the know, there's not that much on, to, you know, about her to, to sort of read or to find out about that's actually useful anyway. Right. There's a lot, like, she's sort of, um, it's funny because, you know, most people associate her with Aleister Crowley, of course, you know, mm. and his, I mean, I love what he did with her <laughs> because he sort of, pulled the the evil you know whore out of revelations and made her holy and this is one of the reasons why i'm a thelemite i mean that partly just that in itself is taking that what what the revelations tried to do to the goddess and turned it on its head and saying she's the holy of holies i mean i think that's amazing um and he brought a lot you know he, he was at least a huge part of bringing the goddess back into ritual magic and all this kind of stuff um but, you know, I think she's more ancient than that. I think that any time we're trying to claim her as only this, and this is her, the goddesses always rebel against that, you know? And there are, just, just as a side thing, I mean, there are a lot of real concerns, like, so about, like, somebody like Kali. You know, there are so definitely some really uh, important social concerns around colonialization or colonization. And... Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And people using these goddesses out of cultural context for their own purposes, and I get that. At the same time, I think these goddesses all have their own current that no one gets to own or direct, really. They tell us, we don't tell them. Um, and it goes, back, it goes both ways, I think, actually. Because we are the goddess, too. So it's, it's very uh, complex, I think. So Babylon... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Babylon is, is, I think of her as the red goddess. She is the grail. You know, she is the cup. She's the, she's called, Crowley calls her the mother of abominations, which I love and makes that holy, which I just love that, that he's turning this into it. Like, in other words, like all the things that you're projecting onto sexuality and onto female power, we're going to turn that, those ideas on their head and on its head and make it holy, you know? Uh, which I just think is so beautiful. She's um, she's the she's the womb. She's the tomb. She's the mother of all. She's the 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 the, the gateway of pyramids. You know, she's the one that call. She's the last. She's the stop that you make when you when you leave the demiurge. You go across the abyss. She's the one who's beckoning through her ultimate powers of seduction. Like, because you're not going to do it otherwise. <laughs> you know? It's kind of like Kali too. You know, they're similar in that respect. Like, you're not going to give it up unless you think that there's something real hot across the, the <laughs> water. There, you, know? Yeah. <laughs> you know. So she's that, but you have to give her all, and she accepts all. She'll accept everything about you. Not a thing about you is unacceptable. But you have to be willing to give everything. Wow. And that's you're a, 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 a dick about it. What's that? It makes your head just go, wow. <laughs> what does that even mean? Because we're so attached to our egos, we have no idea. And that's her beauty. I mean, that's the whole journey, I think, toward enlightenment, is that we don't know what that means. That's amazing. My head's going to be thinking about that good for a good few days. Yes. Yeah.
<laughs> it's good. It was amazing. Um, I even, yeah, that's just really, but it's something that's not, it's just not heard. You don't get people that look at to these things straight away. It's just that that itself is such a, an amazing key to why we, we follow these paths, why we follow the dark goddess, not just to be, to be go that way, that this is such a path to enlightenment and to clear, yeah, to clear the ego. So ah, I love it. I love it. So if anyone wants to find out more about about you and your work with the Dark Goddess, I know you do a lot of Dark Goddess readings in astrology. How does that work? How do you bring up shadowing and people's issues and how to move through them in the astrology? But how do you work with the Dark Goddess in astrology? I know this is it Dark Moon Lilith, isn't it? That's in the chart, which is quite a powerful one. Yeah, there's a few things that I look at. So I look at um, Pluto. I think of, uh, in fact, there's an astrologer called uh, Donna Cunningham, who's, who's been a real shaper of, of modern astrology, um, that talked about Pluto in that way, as that her, the glyph actually is, is the dark goddess, and Persephone and Pluto are really kind of the same unit, even maybe in a different way than Persephone and, and Demeter or... Series, you know, Proserpine and series. Yeah. So, um, and that the Liz Green talks about Pluto also as being the animus of the dark goddess. He's like, you know, the way that a woman has an animus, like we have a male self, like he's her male self. So yeah, he's the rapist in the myths and he's the, the violator, but he's directed, he does this in the name of the dark goddess. And I find that to be so chilling and Beautiful at the same time, because basically this is how Persephone gained her power. Yeah. She gained it by being violated and overcoming that and say, and, and eating the pomegranate, like, like really biting into her own fertility, you know, getting bloody, saying, yeah, I'm ready to not be a naive, you know, kid looking at, a, you know, Narcissus, the flower Narcissus is like looking in the mirror. Aren't I cute in my little party dress? <gasps> nope, not anymore. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so um, and then I look at Saturn. Saturn's related to Kali and Shiva. Uh, time, Kala, time, right? I look at the eighth house in Scorpio because that's very related to the dark goddess, also. And and as you said, dark moon Lilith. I look at that to see um, to see what might be going on, and then the transits. Yeah, yeah, cool. Amazing, absolutely. Um, and I know you've got to go soon, so I've got something to say, but I'm trying to bring it into a into a, a point for you. Um, so I've got ten minutes. You've got ten minutes. You've got ten minutes more. That's good. That's good. So um, it's really awesome. So when when you're doing the readings, what can that you know with the with the, with the astrology and with looking at Lilith and Saturn, you know, what do you put? What does that point out for people in in their chart? What does it show? Was it was it illuminate in their charts where these um, are positioned? So, like, you mean personally about each person? I would say um, that this is their place of both crisis and growth. Mm -hmm. This is the place in their chart where re great deepening is required, um, where that sort of, where they might access their kundalini energy. You know, and again, that's a term that gets thrown around, and, and many people who are really into tantra and have studied these Eastern, uh, you know, Eastern yoga and tantra very very deeply sort of resent that people sort of say, yeah, kundalini, you know, like that snake thing. <laughs> it started somewhere to actually get acquainted with it. So, you know, um, you might hear my dog snoring. His face is on my lap. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He's a boy. His name is He's, a famous, He's a famous puppy. He's a kind of famous dog. I, if I tilt this, you can see him. Everything will fall. My wine and everything. Um, but, you know, all that kind of stuff, like where one might have probably had crises in their lives and, and giving it, so part of my task, I feel, like when I'm doing this reading is giving that meaning, like this is where these kinds of things are probably coming up for you a lot, and this is the medicine, this can give it more meaning to you. There are archetypes that, you know, we can talk about and mythological stories that we can talk about where you can actually get wisdom from the sto these goddesses that... Never did this and do it all the time, you know? <laughs> exactly. And also I think it's, you know, a lot of people think that life and the crises and are things that happen to them that they have no um, control over or can't really work with and showing that this is actually their path and they can not control it, but they can transform through it is such a powerful thing. It takes away the victim 
put from it and, and makes you able to transform and heal through these things. Exactly. And that, and that, that's the point. Like it's not just something that happens and you have to sort of suck it up. You know, that there's a reason. It happens because you're being shown something. And in fact, this is a great gift. And the more you're able to receive that, the more you're going to be acquainted with your own divine light and be able to stand on your own two feet in life and say, you know, I don't need to be attached to these things I thought I did. And this is who I really am. Yeah, and, and maybe it will stop happening to you. The moment you take the power with it, it stops happening. So that's also another good thing. The demons tend to leave you alone then. Yes. Woo! You give them the homage. You say, all right, demons. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think so yeah, really what's, what's next? You know, um, goetic magic, where it's like you, you, you conjuring up demons and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of witches won't even touch that. But you're basically dealing with your own shadow through these demons and and bringing them up and then saying, okay, you and me, mano a mano, you know, like we're, we're going to do this and, and we're going to see what we can out of this and make, make good for us, you know? <laughs> yes. Exactly. It takes the fear, it takes the fear out of, you know, I know you face the fear, not takes it, but you face that fear. Right. You become a master instead of a victim. Woohoo! We like that. <laughs> See, like, all worthwhile. It makes boobs out and getting cut by a sword in a play really okay worth it. I knew I was a master then, for sure. <laughs> or at least I was on my way. I was like, all right. She really did show up. Great. <laughs> yes. Yay, yeah, you think you're a rock star? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Oh. Well, and she's the, the reason I did that performance at Star and Stage, she's the patron goddess of their, their space. Hello, Gwiddy. <laughs> Hi, Mouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, and also I know you um, organized an event, a big, is it called a cult in Salem as well? Are you still doing that? Yes, we are. We, we took off this year. Um, there were some... some stuff around the space and we decided to like like working with dark goddess energies you know we decided okay you know what what like we're not gonna try to make this like pace a smile on make this great we're gonna actually take this energy recycle it into something that's gonna really work and make this like twice as good next time so like we have um, we're looking at July 2016 right now and we're hoping to make it like an international event, have it at a hotel where we can have people come stay and like make that as easy and seamless as possible for people. Because it's really been a homegrown event and, you know, we we're very pleased to have it at all, you know. And now we've gotten enough, you know, experience with it that it can grow. And we're really excited about that. So it's sort of a pan occult. It's not just a thelemic event. Sometimes people think it's a thelemic event or they think it's a belly dance event. Because Sarah and I, Sarah Wood and I are both belly dancers. So they think it's going to be a belly dance event. But it's actually a pan occult arts based event. So it's about the arts. Nice. Oh, it's magic, as Crowley said, you know? Yeah. That sounds amazing. That sounds absolutely awesome. So that's exciting. And how do you find time for all these things? You've got the dancing and the astrology. And also, then you're doing, um, is it you're a musician as well? I play piano, yeah, and I sing, and I, that's what gets cut out right now, unfortunately. And, oops, witty, come on. <laughs> it's, his, it's his dinner at four, so he wants his dinner, and he's just going to be fine. He had snacks with his downstairs. Um, he's like, it's 11 minutes past four, Mom. <laughs> that's what he's saying. He's a cattle dog, so he's really all about schedules. He's an Australian cattle dog, so he wants to, like, but he's a little bit of a tyrant, and he needs to relax. So, or he's going to anyway, right? You're a good boy. I love him more than I can possibly say. I love this boy. <laughs> um, so what was the question? Oh, a call to it We went doggy and then I lost it. I wake up very early <laughs> and get started right away. And part of the reason I wake up early is because I have this cattle dog who wakes me up every day at 6.30 a.m. So I need one of those. So I, do not, I do not get up early. Yeah. Without fail. It doesn't matter if mama hang, has hangover. It doesn't, 
I go to work anyway at 6.30. So, um, yeah, the time thing, that's tough. So, oh, as I was saying, yeah, the music, that's what's being sort of put on the back burner, and that's something I'd like to rectify for sure. Um, but dance, you know, astrology, a lot of magic, and, the, all, you know, the, all the work that I'm doing with that, and rituals, and lots of stuff for sure. Yeah, and you, you got to have some things have to go on the back burner, don't they? Otherwise, it all gets a bit diluted. But um, you're doing lots of amazing, creative, creative stuff. And I think the, re the readings really taken off over the last year or so. Or has it kind of been a slow burn? The astrology. Hmm. No, it, it's been a really steady um, uh, journey upward with it. It's it's very. I'm I'm very pleased. You know. So I think of like my belly dance pieces, like my Babylon. And then the, the, my my uh, my astrology is my Nuit self, you know. You think of those two goddesses as being the the, the, the two, you know, in the Flemic pantheon. Nuit being the starry sky, and and Babylon being Babylon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Babylon, you know, right? So so uh, yeah, they're sort of the two sides of my my own personality. Oh, so that's a good balance. I think that's an amazing balance. So if people want to um, get hold of you for readings and things, um, where can they find you if they want to get their own astrology chart looked at? And especially in the way that you work, which is just so holistic and it just feels so deep to the core. It's not, it's the last thing you're doing is skating over the surface. You're just going so deep with people. How can they um, get hold of you? Um, Aprilsastrology.com is a great way. My name is spelled A E. P R I L, so that's and then you know astrology. So that's that's the, that's the link at the bottom underneath the the link will be down here. Yes. Great, thank you for doing that. And then you know I have my new eat reports every Friday. So those They're are brilliant. I Please. love the blog post you put today with the cat's face about the eclipse. I was like, <laughs> that's it. That is how I feel today. <laughs> totally, that's when I saw that. Well, I, you know what I did because I was. Looking up the word intense, because I wanted to get to, what's the root word, like intense? Like, I, I think I'll get something out of that to write about. And then I, I went to images of intense, and that cat was the first image on Google. And I was like, perfect. Totally. I know that a cat is the first image of intense. I don't even know. I can't even. <laughs> I just saw it scroll up on Facebook. These pictures scroll up on Facebook, and I was like, I feel like that. I feel like that. <laughs> Yeah. Totally. <laughs> he's all like multi he's all psychedelic colors and stuff too you know it's <laughs> great <laughs> oh yes because the eclipse so we're in eclipse season and was, was it yesterday wasn't it was the new moon eclipse yeah yesterday was the the new moon well yeah new moon solar eclipse like all solar eclipses are new moons and you know not all new moons are solar eclipses though so it's like a new moon on steroids um you know Right, that cat. <laughs> when there's that cat in here as well, people know what we're talking about. They're not just doing this. <laughs> <have to> put... <laughs> <laughs> the intense eclipse. <laughs> oh my god, it's been like that, you know. Like definitely, I feel like I'm I'm moving really fast, and but it's also a great opportunity for a reset button. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So eclipses, and they're 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 thought of as a shifting of power because the solar means the king, right? The sun. And when it means an eclipse of power. So uh, the power of the king shifts. Ah, that's very interesting. It's interesting as well, we had like, we had uh, a new uh, party leader, political party leader to take over yesterday as well. So that's kind of interesting. The, date, the dates they choose to make these things happen. Yes. Right. Right. That's yeah. a whole, that's a whole other of, 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 of things but uh, yeah I thought I'd got away quite lightly with the eclipse then cried a day today and I was like I thought I got away I didn't get away oh, it'll, get, it'll get you and then it doesn't always hit you on the day that it happens you know it can be like weeks before or after there's lead yeah. up I'm I think that those of us who are fairly we're really sensitive it doesn't happen this way every time but often if we're sensitive people to currents we'll have the crisis before and there will be the ones who will be fine, like when the eclipse actually happens, and then everybody else is freaking out, you know? Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And Definitely. then we have the moon coming up, and that's a really, talk about the dark goddess, you know, we're talking about that and the red goddess, like the blood moon uh, that's coming up on the 27th, or the 28th, 27th, I can't remember, it's like, it's on, the, like, right on the cusp of those two dates. Um, I don't know where it'll be for you guys. Um, but... 
that's going to be a whopper too at four degrees Aries. So that's very red goddess. It's very dark goddess, bloody menstrual, <laughs> ah, crony, hormones, hormone thing. Just <laughs> all the feminine stuff, you know, because that's the moon getting eclipsed. So, it's, you know, we'll, yeah. So that's like all emotions, reset button on the instinctual self, you know. Yeah, and you go ahead. So you can never prepare either for the eclipses, can you? Because they're going to hit you in any random way. So you're like okay. exactly where you're not prepared. Because if you think you know where to prepare, you're using your conscious mind to prepare, and where it hits you is your unconscious. So you can't possibly know because it's unconscious. So you can't do it. <laughs> just wait for it to happen and say, ah, thank you. <laughs> I needed that spanking. <laughs> I'm just going to cry for a day now. Thank you. <laughs> but it shows you exactly where you're not. It shows you. It's like a mirror showing you the back of your head. You know, you can't see it. Yeah. What I was going to say is I see uh, your art in back of you there. It's very lovely. Oh, yeah. Looks like it. There. <laughs> I thought the yin and yang and the dark and the light, I thought it would be a nice one to have. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm such a romantic. I've got flowers, I've got wine. <laughs> you do flowers and wine. I just have my green background that I always have for all my new eat reports here. And there's some sun on the, I see some flash of something over there. Uh, I don't know, something on the wall. I don't know. It's a little spirit just sort of hanging with us tonight. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, I better let you go because I know you have to head off. I don't want to to make you late for the rest of your day. Thank you. But it's been so awesome. Thank you so much. It's been hilarious and, and insightful as well. And a little bit wild and wild wisdom and wine. And that's exactly, I think we've kicked this series off in the right spirit, I think. I think so too. And we managed to pull this off with Mercury going retrograde. I, I mean, it was a bit of a, we really, really struggle everybody to get online. That happened first, but we did it. It's fine. It's all done. We figured it out. I, this was like, I, yeah, what, whatever. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> did it. Okay, I shall. Um, thank you so, so much. It's been absolutely awesome. And definitely keep in touch. And I'll put all your, your contact websites below this video for people to come and see what you're up to. And definitely check out April's um, Nuit Report Weekly because it's, it's just a goddess send, really. It really helps to get your head around what's going on. Thank you so much again. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been my great pleasure. It's been a real honor. <laughs> Lots of love. Bye.